Dr. Santos, thank you so much for joining us here on Health Connection. Our topic is post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. It's a condition normally associated with military veterans who served in combat, but more and more as the, as the traumatic events in the world intrude, we find people who've not been in the military suffering from P PTSD uh, as a result of natural disasters and the things that we unfortunately read about in the news. So let's start off with a definition. What is PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder? Okay. So PTSD is a cluster of symptoms that we see that can occur either immediately after a traumatic event or can occur once, even years after a traumatic event occurs. Um, and those individuals that suffer from PTSD have either either witnessed a traumatic event themselves, been part of it, such as uh, a military uh, personnel in, in combat, um, or has been present when a traumatic event has occurred to somebody else, such as a, someone who has witnessed a car accident or a young child who has witnessed domestic violence in the home. Um, they can, PTSD symptoms can also occur after just hearing about a very traumatic or violent event that's occurred to a loved one or a family member. Um, this commonly is the loss of a family member for young children or uh, people of any age. Um, and so the four kind of symptom areas that we see um, are, first one would be re-experiencing the, the trauma, whether it's in a flashback in which they feel that they're actually in, involved in the trauma again, they can see things and hear things just as they did in the traumatic event, or in form of nightmares or just intrusive mm -hmm. thoughts about the event, right? Mm -hmm. The second symptom uh, cluster that we see is avoidance, so either avoidance of people, places, and things that remind them of the traumatic event, or avoidance of the, un the unpleasant thoughts related to the traumatic event itself. We also see a, a, the third cluster of symptoms that we see um, is a hyperarousal, or just increased arousal overall. So this can be easily, being easily startled. Um, commonly, we have veterans who return from war if they hear a, a car backfire or a firecracker go off. Um, they interpret it as a gunshot and will throw themselves to the ground. So that would be an example of uh, being very easily startled. They have difficulty relaxing, um, always kind of feel like they're tense or on edge. They may have difficulty sleeping um, and they can have bouts of irritability or anger that appear to come out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. But it's part of that hyperarousal um, cluster of symptoms that we see. The last cluster of symptoms that we see can be just as debilitating as the other ones. It's difficulty with or changes in cognition, so difficulty with memory, um, forgetfulness, or changes in mood. So that can be just lack of pleasure and not being able to enjoy things in life they used to enjoy, um, feeling anhedonic, uh, being dysphoric, um, hopeful, d hopeless. D okay. Mm -hmm. That's so what dysphoric is, hopeless, is that? Well, dysphoric is just la inability to feel happiness. Okay. Uh, and anhedonia would be inability to feel pleasure. So those are some of the things that we see in terms of the mood and cognition changes. So those four areas are what we focus on when we're um, diagnosing, evaluating for and diagnosing PTSD. Give us an example of a typical military veteran who's diagnosed with PTSD. What are we looking at? Okay, and so the symptoms can occur either immediately after combat or they can take a while to occur. Some symptoms will occur sooner than others and some will take, like I said, maybe even years to develop. So generally we'd see an avoidance of any type of trigger um, that would remind them of combat. So avoidance of watching the news, sometimes avoidance of people altogether. So they may isolate themselves to their home, um, avoid going to public places or crowded public places, particularly malls or areas in which they cannot immediately control their environment. Um, control of their environment is a big thing. If they would go into restaurants or other public areas, they would need to be in the back where they can see all of their surroundings around them so that they feel like they're in control. Um, oftentimes they have very poor sleep habits, so they'll stay awake all night because that's a period where they feel threatened and they may sleep during the day or they may not sleep at all. Um, oftentimes they will self-medicate using alcohol or drugs to diminish or to numb those intrusive thoughts or those flashbacks. Um, and so it can be very difficult for them initially to enter back into civilian life. And that's when we really see a lot of the symptoms, but they can come up even later in life, de sometimes even decades later. Um, well, that segues into our next question. Does PTSD manifest itself in veterans gradually or does it onset rapidly? And, well, that's a good question. It varies from individual to individual. 
the most common scenario would be that we see the sleep disturbances um, and the hypervigilance almost immediately. And so they would return from combat and have those symptoms. While they're still in combat, they are still in a fight or flight kind of mode. And so they may not realize those symptoms until they come back into civilian life and then their sleep is disrupted. Um, the avoidance of public places um, and the nightmares would be some of the first things that we see. When should a veteran, or for that matter, anybody who you suspect is suffering PTSD, when should they begin seeking treatment? So one of the most important things when we're talking about treatment of PTSD is timing. We want to identify it as early on as possible and treat it as quickly as possible. So for instance, with veterans, they often have an immediate post-deployment interview with a health professional, whether it's a psychiatrist or a primary care physician or a nurse practitioner when they're exiting um, their, employ their deployment. And that's very important, but we also know that it's very important for them to have a follow-up screening. So three or four months out from combat, I'm talking about veterans now, but this would relate to anybody who has been exposed to a traumatic event. Um, because as I highlighted before, some of the symptoms take weeks, months, or even years to develop. The difficulty with that is if someone is, has developed PTSD and is suffering from, say, avoidance of thoughts about this or uh, avoidance of interacting with people, it may be difficult to do that follow-up screening um, with veterans or with um, children or adults who have witnessed any type of traumatic event. But ideally, immediately after the event, after, of course, after they feel safe and secure in their environment, um, and then again, at, at least three or four months out as a second screening. Societies have been sending their men off to war since there have been societies, so mm -hmm. it, it's, it, it has always been there. But when did we arrive at PTSD as an actual clinical diagnosis? So PTSD was not an, always called PTSD. Um, in the past, it was first recognized in World War I, and it was called shell shock at that time. Same cluster of symptoms was recognized, but different name. Right. And World War II, that was when the, the first sort of coining of post-traumatic stress disorder occurred and then picked up preva prevalence in terms of um, awareness and the Vietnam War, and that's really when most of the studies, the emerging studies came out on the actual entity of post-traumatic stress disorder, so in the late 60s and early 70s. All right, interesting. Children, adolescents, and the elderly also can be affected by PTSD. Why, and give us some examples. Okay, certainly that's a very good question. I think people don't recognize that it can show up um, in younger adults and children as well. Um, the prevalence of traumatic events, unfortunately, in children and adolescents is very high. Some studies show up to 40, 45 percent of children will be exposed to a traumatic event during their lifetime. So it makes sense that they are going to suffer from PTSD as well. Children are seen to have some res more resiliency at times than adults and may not develop uh, PTSD at the same prevalence, but certainly they do. In very young children, it can be very difficult to detect because the symptoms are not the ones that I highlighted earlier with the re-experiencing phenomenon, um, the avoidance, uh, and the mood symptoms. Generally, we see a regression in their behavior. So for instance, if they had been potty trained or toilet trained, they may start wetting their bed at nighttime. Um, they may start being very clingy, overly clingy with the adults or their caretakers. Um, and their behavior may regress altogether where they don't do things for themselves that they used to be able to do um, for themselves. And of course their, their mood can change as well, but it's not the classic dysphoria or, or depressed mood um, and lack of enjoyment that we see in adults. They may become more clingy as I stated or more irritable or agitated. And generally, you'll see this in their play. So in their play with imaginary animals or with other children, it may take on a more aggressive um, or more agitated demeanor. With adolescents, they're more similar to adults in the way that they display um, their PTSD symptoms. A uh, big difference is that they can be more irritable and more revenge-seeking in terms of wanting to get even for the, um, for the trauma occurring with to them, but otherwise they present uh, very similarly as adults. So they would have the avoidance and the re-experiencing, the hyperarousal and the mood symptoms that go along with PTSD. And what about the elderly? And with elderly, 
um, we see uh, many times a resurgence or even an increase in the expression of PTSD symptoms. Um, and they're very similar to those that, uh, in adults that I had uh, talked about earlier. But sometimes they're increased because of a number of factors. Um, they tend to be more isolated. Um, they don't have as much of a, a social support network that they may have when they were younger. Um, retirement and that change in life role that comes with retirement can be a big trigger. Um, they may have sort of delved into work when they were younger and now they have more time to think about and um, all the traumatic event that occurred. Um, and so oftentimes we actually can see an increase in the PTSD symptoms um, or uh, resurgence of PTSD symptoms in the elderly um, because of their change in life function. Um, and oftentimes it's associated with uh, poor physical conditions, sometimes a loss of income or lower income. And the big one, I think, being um, less of a social uh, connectedness with retirement and old age. Mm -hmm. How do terrorism and natural disasters affect the number of potential cases for, for all these age groups? Right. And so certainly I, I believe we're going to see an increase in the reports and the numbers of PTSD. Now whether this is actually increasing the percentage of people who are affected by PTSD, it's difficult to state. Most people who are going to be affected by the newscast of natural disasters or uh, mass killings um, have an underlying predisposition already, meaning that they may have already experienced a trauma and have had PTSD in the past or have anxiety or underlying depression. Those are the people it's going to affect most. Um, as per the American Psychiatric Association, exposure to media itself of coverage, unless it, it intimately affects our community or our own sense of safety within our immediate surroundings, does not increase PTSD. But I think from a clinical perspective, we are going to see PTSD expression more um, because people who have an underlying PTSD symptoms or anxiety and depression are going to feel the burden of uh, this constant 24-hour monitoring of, of different uh, traumatic events around the world. Well, let's just say, for example, that somebody is a part of one of these horrendous news stories we've had of late, you know, the, the, the police shootings in Dallas or the, the uh, nightclub attack in Orlando. Mm -hmm. If someone is there for that and is a participant in it, what is the likelihood that that individual will have PTSD symptoms? So the likelihood of an untrained person, meaning not a, a firefighter or a police officer or a first responder who uh, firsthand witnesses this is very high, particularly within the first month, two or three months, upwards of 50% or more. Um, fortunately, individuals tend to be resilient, and so that number will taper off greatly by three to six months. But we're looking at at least half the percentage of people, half people who witness this firsthand um, will develop PTSD symptoms uh, by three month time frame. Okay. How do you treat PTSD and are the treatment approaches different depending on the patient, age, gender, thing, and those kinds of variables? Right. So treatment in general, PTSD follows a line of both um, psychotherapy or talk therapy uh, and medication, but of course that's going to vary depending on the age and the severity. Um, first and foremost, when an individual undergoes a traumatic event, there has to be what we call a first response or first aid. We have to help the patient feel that they're safe in their environment um, and eliminate any obstacles to that safety, um, so, such as providing shelter, food, things of that nature. Um, once the dust settles, so to speak, and they, um, we, they're out of the immediate time frame of harm, and it's very important for them to undergo um, talk therapy. Um, some people will be very resistant to therapy, especially initially, and that's understandable. It goes along with part of the symptoms of avoidance of thoughts of the traumatic event. Um, so that may need to be revisited at three months out or six months out if, if the person is not willing to engage in therapy right, at, right after the incident. Um, so therapy is very important. In young children, we often um, engage in play therapy. So instead of talk therapy, you would play with them with a dollhouse or have them reenact um, the event. And you don't ask them to reenact it, you play with them and they will start to reenact it and you help them come up with a better solution mm -hmm. um, instead of the traumatic outcome, um, a more uh, pleasant outcome. 
uh, but in older um, adolescents, adults, um, and the elderly, talk therapy is you know going to be the mainstay of, tr of treatment. There is a specialized cognitive behavioral therapy for trauma, um, and that is what's most commonly employed. Um, medications can be very helpful as well, particularly antidepressants, which help to improve the mood and decrease those, those cognitive and mood symptoms that we talked about. Also help decrease the hyperarousal and improve the sleep. Um, and oftentimes we use other types of medication as needed, depending on their individual symptoms. Okay. We just touched on this a moment ago. It's been documented those who've lived through events such as a 9-11, uh, civilians and first responders both have a high risk for PTSD. You said 50% or greater. Yes. Are there signs for PTSD for them that are different than those for a combat veteran? Lar largely, they would be the same. The time frames at which they're expressed may be different, but we're looking at the same clusters of symptoms. Obviously, their triggers are going to be different, or and the things that they avoid are going to be different. So combat veterans would may uh, you know avoid loud crowded noisy areas if they were in combat in the Middle East um, and that's where they would employ um, different techniques uh, people carrying bombs in large crowded areas for instance um, but largely they're going to have this similar constellation of symptoms so the hyper arousal symptoms the nightmares um, and feeling easily startled avoidance of where the event occurred or watching TV or going to the memorials for people who the traumatic events occurred to. Um, they're largely going to be the same, but they will have a different flavor depending on what the, tra the traumatic event was. We live in, a, in a, an era of media ubiquity, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Media, social media, over the air. Uh, does the volume of coverage of terrorism attacks and other, and other disasters increase our risk of PTSD? And if so, should we just reduce our exposure to media for our children and for ourselves? Certainly. I, and if we live in an area where we're always afraid the next turn there's going to be the next terrorist attack, that's the, our environment, uh, which is very important in development of any type of um, psychiatric condition, um, is stressed. And so if we are constantly bombarding ourselves uh, and our body starts to feel threatened, right, and then we are at an increased risk when we do ex experience trauma, um, to develop PTSD. And so, yes, I would say for small children and, and adolescents, um, the, the, the news needs to be filtered and in smaller increments than 24 hours a day all the time on Facebook. Um, and this stands for adults as well. Um, bombarding yourself with 24-hour coverage of you know, the incidents in France or the incidents in Dallas um, or these mass other mass shootings, you know, it could definitely wreak havoc on your psychological well-being, which sets you up um, to be more vulnerable to develop PTSD. Typically, how well do patients respond to treatment? PTSD can be a chronic disorder, and so some may have symptoms uh, until they die. Um, others, will the symptoms will be more acute, and within three to six months, um, they will certainly lessen. Uh, the numbers of people who respond to PTSD is difficult to gauge, largely because people who have PTSD do not always follow through with their treatment. Um, but I would say that a significant symptom reduction can be expected in at least 50 to 75 percent of patients who initially present with PTSD. Okay. Yeah. So if someone feels that they themselves or someone close to them is mm -hmm. suffering from PTSD, what's the next step that he or she should take and what resources are available here at UT Health Northeast? So if, if you yourself or a loved one is suffering from PTSD symptoms, the first thing you have to do is to ensure their immediate safety, right? So in, in a combat veteran, for instance, that may be removing guns from the home um, or removing any other type of uh, risk factors for self-harm or harm to others. Um, the second step would be to contact a mental health professional. Um, in the case of UT um, Health Northeast, I would suggest calling the, the family medicine practice that we have here. You do require a referral for our, either a psychiatrist or a therapist, um, and that would be the first step. Um, the number to make an appointment there is 903-877-7200. And um, once you make an, an appointment with your family practitioner, they can refer you to either a therapist or a psychiatrist or both. Um, 
but importantly, immediate safety is important, and then referring them to a mental health professional. Other uh, um, avenues of help can be any type of support group, so whether it's a religious support group, um, your religious community, or your community at whole, your family, um, just increase the surveillance of, of the individual, whether it's yourself or somebody else. Make sure that you're around uh, other people as much as possible so that they can pick up uh, when symptoms are worsening. But also that, that professional help is important, aside from the increased social contact. Very well. Doctor learned a lot. Thank you very much mm -hmm. for your time. You're welcome. My pleasure.